Okay, welcome to class. Let's pray and uh, begin. I'll pray. Abba Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace in our lives. Thank you, uh, Father, especially that we have this opportunity to study the book of Acts. Let the word of God come alive. You lead us, O oh God, uh, through your word. And Father, as, as we are um, seeing the different um, incidents unfold, Lord, uh, we pray, God, that the kind of courage that uh, the early believers carried will, will come upon us as well, O oh God, and help us to do the works of God with power. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this point, we've come to Acts chapter 5. Uh, Acts chapter 4, we had seen that Peter and John were held for a notable miracle. They were threatened and yet they went back and prayed for boldness and the power of God, supernatural power of God to be demonstrated through them. The church continued to have grace and grow. That's where we were at. People were generous as well. They were giving from the sales of their own uh, properties. They were laying it at the apostles' feet so that nobody would lack anything in the believing community. There was one particular couple. In the beginning of Acts chapter 5, we saw Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, and very unfortunate that they sold what they had. They brought it to Peter. Yet they showed off as if they had given all that they received, which was the problem. And Peter, by the Holy Spirit, by the word of knowledge, knew it. People were trying to hide it. Uh, but thank God, you know, our God is a God who knows all things. There, there is nothing hidden uh, in, in the darkness for him. There are a couple of uh, wonderful scriptures in our notes. Let me quickly look at that and share it with us. Okay. Yes. Matthew 10 verse 26, which says, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Hebrews 4 verse 13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So while people thought that they could escape by lying, at this point, they're not able to. And we, we also ask the question, you know, why did um, Ananias die immediately? Peter told him his mistake. And verse 5 says, hearing these words fell down and breathed this last. Great fear came upon those who heard these things. Reason was that it was an environment of revival. When there is great grace, great power, there seems like there is also great judgment. And immediately this man died. Um, what else can we notice here? He and his wife, you know, both of them were uh, the people who wanted to deceive, deceive God's people. This kind of deception, what does pe what does Peter actually say to them? Verse 4, let's look at verse 4 here. While it remained, was it not in your own control? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have, you have not lied to men, but to God. So he says that they lied. They lied to God. And verse 9, let's look at verse 9 here. He says, you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. So test the spirit of the Lord and lie to God. Do you think these two things are wrong? Yeah, very serious, very serious. By now, there are uh, almost about you know 12,000 people who have joined the church. Um, 
it, the church community has grown. God is doing a powerful work. These people have seen God's wonderful work. But what is it that they're lacking? There's something that they're lacking. Fear of God. Fear of God. You know? So uh, that's very dangerous. You know, in, in our Christian walk with the Lord, reverence, honor to the Lord and walking in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. We can try to do great things for God, but if we don't have the fear of God, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Uh, and these people, Ananias and Sapphira, in such a beautiful growing community, having seen the wonders of God, are lacking the fear of God. And they lied to God. They tried to test God. But as we just saw, nothing is hidden from our God, to whom we must give account. And so judgment was almost instant. Ananias fell down, was five, and he died. And young men came, and they carried him out and buried him. So a death has happened in the church. Verse 7, it says, it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Strange, isn't it? Three hours and she didn't know. Today we have WhatsApp and everything goes like that. But three hours and she didn't know that uh, her husband came under judgment. She comes and it's as if God is giving her a chance. And Peter is asking, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She could have spoken the truth. But what did she do? She said, yes, for so much. She lied also. Peter gets really angry. He tells her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Okay. So both husband and wife in this situation, we always talk about the power of agreement and how beautiful it is, but they used it for the wrong reason. They used it to lie to the Holy Spirit and to deceive God uh, and his people. So he says, you've agreed together to test the spirit. And there's judgment on her also. He says, look, those who just buried your husband, they're coming back and they are going to take you as well. Verse 10, judgment. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. Verse 11, once again, great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So when judgment takes place like this, there's a fear, right? Like, oh my goodness, you know, God is real. Uh, we cannot play around with God. And that was the message that went out loud and clear. And the people in the believing community receive the fear of the Lord. Okay, uh, and, and that's what God did in Acts chapter 5. What happens to the community now? Will the work stop or will the work continue? Thank God from verse 12, we see that the work is only continuing. Um, we have instance instances where you know, miracles were still taking place. So there were many signs and wonders, verse 12. Um, people were continuing in prayer. So all were in one accord, verse 12. Uh, there was respect for leadership, verse 13. So in an orderly way, things are moving on in the church community. Uh, the numbers are increasing. Uh, multitudes, in fact, it says. So that means like, you know, uh, the church is thriving. Nothing has stopped. There are unusual miracles. What is that unusual miracle? There's a record of Peter's shadow healing the people. Generally, that's not how we saw healing. For healing, people would lay hands, you know, or issue a word of command. But in this case, shadow, very strange. But you see, God is God. He can work however he uh, pleases. So even through the shadow, people are getting healed. So much so, you know, uh, was, was the wonderful work of God that people from other cities started coming in for healing and deliverance. So that demonstrates that God was still at work. Now, when these things were happening, 
It's a threat again for the authorities. They had already told Peter and John, don't preach in this name. But Peter and John said, hey, whether we should listen to you or listen to God, you, you only tell us. So obviously, they have not heeded the instruction of the authorities. And the authorities come to know that work is still going on. The community is thriving. So they get angry. And what do they do the second time? They again go and they lay their hands on the apostles, meaning they caught them. They caught them. And they kept them in the common prison. You know what happened then? Apostles are in the prison, but at night, at night, another supernatural incident took place. And that is, God sent an angel to open the prison doors and brought them out. Have we seen any other prison open up supernaturally? Ah, Paul and Silas, when they worshipped, the shackles were broken, not just theirs, but others also. So supernatural things happen when you know we are serving the Lord, when we are on track. Apostles are on track. They are not doing anything which God is displeased with. And so there is a miracle of an angel going and setting them free. Now, we may think that the angel has set them free and uh, you know they'll be happy to go back home and maybe take a rest. Right? But there's an instruction from the angel in verse 20 where the angel tells them, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So it's like taking them out of the prison, sending them back into the battlefield. Why did God do that? God could have given them a rest. OK, you escape the prison. Guys, go home, sleep. OK, or eat something nice, take rest. No, they are released back into the work of God. And think about the boldness that they would have needed. If they go to the temple, everyone will look at them. Authorities will again see them. They'll be in danger again. But they were bold enough. They went back and, you know, they went back to the temple early in the morning and taught. So the authorities were furious at this point. And they were wondering, like, you know, how did these people come out of the prison? So there is an account of this uh, person by the name uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh uh, that apparently, you know, he was thrown into a well and uh, it was locked. It was locked. Like, the throw people so that they can die there. Um, but supernaturally, supernatu uh, like he, there was a rope or something that came in. I don't know the details of the story, but it is to this effect that he comes out of that well. Okay, And uh, the people who put him in the well are questioning, how did this happen? Who among us has done this? And the funny part is, uh, the access to the well, the keys of the well were on the main person's belt. So there was no way that anyone had the keys for them to open the well and for him to come out. But it But God did it supernaturally. He actually brought him out. And it was very clear for the people because keys are with the main person. So it never went anywhere. How did this man come out? So there are times when God does these amazing things of even bringing people out of the prison. And he has done it for the apostles. And later on, we see for Paul and Silas. Uh, however, they were put back into the work of God. And they boldly went back, preaching once again. Um, but again, when the officers saw them, right, they wanted to interrogate them. So, uh, you know, they start to question. So they are under trial. So from verse 22 onwards, you know, we, we see the trial of the apostles. They are instructed. They're asked in verse 28, you know, uh, they asked them, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name and look you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. So the authorities recognize that uh, these apostles have been disobedient to uh, their command. 
and now at this point you know they have to really think what to do about these people so again peter he says we ought to obey god rather than men and we've discussed this when it comes to the authorities telling us uh, to go against worshiping god those are things that we cannot obey but everything else that is given under the law we can obey so that's why uh, peter says we ought to obey god rather than men and again he talks about the greatness of our lord jesus you know he talks about jesus as uh, being exalted to the right hand of god uh, to be the prince and the savior he talks about um, giving repentance to israel and forgiveness of sins and he also talks about um, uh, the fact that they the apostles are witnesses to these things uh and uh, he's bold he's bold before the people but now what happens is there is a discussion among the authorities now they are discussing they, they don't know what to do okay and uh, whether to imprison them whether to kill them at this point so it's a tricky situation so what exactly is going to happen uh, is what we have to look at but something interesting see the first time they were in trouble they were in the prison how did they get res uh, rescued by angels okay done now the second time okay god is working through one of the leaders there and who is that you know he is this person called gamaliel and it's unusual they they were literally ready to kill the apostles but at that time the wisdom of this learned man gamaliel uh, they heard him out so from verse 38 and 39 this is what gamaliel said can someone read it out please verse 38 ah 38 okay and now i say to you keep away from these men and let them alone for if this plan if this plan or this work is of men it will come to nothing but if it is of god you cannot overthrow it lest you even be found to fight against god yeah so gamaliel in all his wisdom see firstly he is very well respected who was trained under gamaliel paul paul was trained under gamaliel so he says he gives the example of another man who was a rebel who led uh, many people astray but he takes his example and says see that man he was destroyed and the people who followed him also because it was their own agenda but if what these people are doing is similar they will get destroyed you don't worry about it you know why are you trying to fight this movement that is taking place but suppose what is going on is not uh, a a human thing if it is from the lord you know in verse 39 that's when he says but if it is of god you cannot overthrow it look at the wisdom okay and he is not he is not a believer he is not a believer so there are times when god can work through unbelievers in authority and their wisdom so this time they're escaping because of what gamaliel said maybe gamaliel thought that shortly all this noise is going to calm down so don't worry about it let them go and his statement if it is of god you cannot overthrow it think about it today till today Acts chapter five, maybe Gamaliel thought it will stop with Acts chapter five. Acts twenty-eight is done. Two thousand years, the work of God is continuing. It's multiplying. Nobody can stop it because it is the work of God. It's not the work of a man, right? So that's the power of the work of God. Who can stop it? The Jewish, you know, the Roman authorities could not. nobody else has been able to and history has it that many have come in the way and tried to stop the work of god but it only 
became greater. Yes. Yes, Lina. Huh. The Old Testament laws and yeah. commandments. Uh -huh. Suddenly to stop all those things and to do the thing, it would be very difficult for the people, you know, for the learned people. And yes. Only people, I mean, it's believing is kind of very difficult from a human uh, perspective. Uh -huh. So, yeah, they are following it from centuries, like, you no, know, they are given that most importance to that. Suddenly, I'm telling, no, everything has changed for the Pharisees. Yes, yes, so yes. So difficult, yes. like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is hard, uh, and especially because their life is based on that tradition. S but it's not impossible. It's very hard, but it's not impossible. See, we must pray as Jesus taught. I mean, as Paul wrote, um, it's Second Corinthians four four, uh, where we must pray for the eyes to be open you know um, that satan has blinded the eyes of these people so they are sincere they are religious uh, however they are not able to see uh, the truth about jesus the gospel so pray for their eyes to be open pray for their hearts to be softened pray for the father to draw them to himself and pray for an encounter paul is a student of gamaliel so he comes from similar traditions but how God touched him? Yeah. We are not saying that it, it has always got to be an encounter of that kind. Uh, but what we are saying is they can accept and their lives can change. Uh, but God has to do a work in their hearts. We must keep praying for it. Yeah. And is it hard? Answer is yeah. Because every, from morning to evening, their rhythm, everything is based on their traditions. And now suddenly we are saying, no, you believe in Jesus and uh, you believe things differently. The whole life is going to uh, change. But God has done it and God can do it. We must pray for such people. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's why they were uh, so strict not to let the gospel be proclaimed. But in all of this, you know, we are seeing we are seeing a miracle. Then we are seeing persecution. Then we are seeing the church grow. Then we are seeing uh, matters happen within the church. Till now, it was from only outside persecution, persecution. One thing we saw happen within the church is that deception of Ananias and Sapphira. So as the church is growing, there are challenges inside also. Uh, but for the leaders, we need wisdom in a growing church community to guide and lead the people in the ways of the Lord. But thank God the apostles had that kind of wisdom and they continued. So at this point, when the second round of uh, persecution seems to be upon them, uh, after listening to Gamaliel, the authorities decide it is better for us. We'll just beat them up uh, again, you know, like a threat. Tell them don't speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So second time they are escaping out okay uh, they came out and verse 41 can someone read it out please so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted they were counted uh, Worthy to suffer the same for his name. Okay, 42 also, Nikhil, please. And uh, daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Okay, so that really tells us, um, you know, at least two things about the apostles and the leaders. They came out of uh, a difficult trial. Okay, one is how they honored God, how they respected God, that they are saying they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So those under persecution are actually happy, not that we're not saying, okay, get, become happy when you're persecuted, but that attitude where, oh, wow, 
I I got the opportunity to stand up for the Lord, and even if I was persecuted, it's like my joy, it's my honor, uh, and that was the kind of attitude that they carried. We know that all the disciples of Jesus also who were martyred, they carried the same. Later on, you know, they um, in each of their stories, that's how they felt about it. They were not feeling like why why am I being persecuted. But they were happy, they were joyful, uh, and they did not think that the persecution that they went through, uh, uh, you know, was was as if God had forgotten them. But instead, they felt that God had counted them worthy to be persecuted. So they honored God, they honored the work of God uh, in their lives. And second thing is their passion. So they've come out of this difficult trial, instead of stopping the work they are going to the temple daily house to house did not cease teaching and preaching in uh, the name of jesus you know and, and that jesus is christ so their passion did not reduce their honor for god and their passion for god continued and that's a huge lesson for us um, even in times of trials and difficulties are we the kind that we can stand up for the lord and uh, serve him and rejoice in the tribulations uh, for his namesake. Okay. I, I recall one uh, book that I read early on in my Christian journey. It's called In God's Underground. It's about uh, a man who was imprisoned for his faith, okay, Richard Wombrin. And uh, it was incredible when I read that book. He was put in the prison and they did many things to make him deny Christ. He was forced to deny Christ, but he never did. He never did. And all the descriptions of what happened in the prison uh, are quite scary. But he loved the Lord so much that he never gave up. And it makes us wonder, when people are going through these trials and persecution, how come their love for the Lord is so strong? Right? And in fact, in that book, one part he writes, he was put in the prison and he was he had memorized you know portions and portions of the scripture. He, uh, there were others in you know different prison rooms. So apparently he tried sharing the gospel even when he was in the prison. You tell me how can you share? You're stuck in one corner. You know what he did? He knew Morse code. You type, right? You you tap. tap. So he, through, through the tapping, he was trying to communicate to co-prisoners the gospel. Wow. It, it's just like amazing. You know, people in their um, pain and difficulty are still sharing the gospel in the prison in the way that is possible. He's tapping on the floor, and with the, with that sound, he gets a response from another a prison, who, somebody who's understanding the sharing of the gospel. So the passion that many of these people have had for the Lord is inspiring for us, and it's good to read about the lives of men and women of God. Now coming to chapter 6. So the church is growing. Nobody could stop God's work, and Gamaliel said that. If it's God's work, we cannot stop it. We come to um, some of the things that are happening within the church community. So right now, there is a problem. Okay, A logistics issue has happened uh, in Acts chapter 6. In those days, I'm going to read a few verses from verse 1. In those days, when the number of the disciples were, was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So in those times, widows were fed. They were helped by the church. But it seemed like the Greek-speaking Jews, they are the Hellenists. Their widows were neglected. Now, was this true or not? We don't know. You see, there are two groups. At least right now, we can observe two groups. The Hebrew-speaking Jews and the Greek-speaking Jews. And apparently, there was a cultural difference 
between these two communities. So there was a little bit of friction among them. One community has raised a complaint against the other community. It could have been true or it could have just been, you know, some mindset of theirs that they are feeling neglected. We don't really know. But anyway, there is an issue. So then what to do? Uh, when a complaint comes from within the church, it seems like a small thing, right? Food distribution. Come on, let's focus on preaching the gospel preaching the word of God. Why should we bother about food distribution? It's like admin logistics. But look at verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the leaders, they decided that they have to find a solution for this problem. For a small issue, imagine if the leader said, we don't want to look into it. It's, it's a food distribution. You know, it's what else? You can say it's... Uh, you know, something to do with uh, anything else? <laughs> Logistics, chair, uh, chair arrangement. Why should we? It's okay, leave it. We won't look into this matter. It's a silly matter. It's a simple matter. But they didn't take it up in a silly or a simple way. So the leadership was keen. Yeah, there is an issue. We have to solve the issue. Thank God for the wisdom of God among them. They said, we will solve the issue. But what we will do is, we will assign volunteers. Six people. Okay, they, they Sorry, seven, seven men. What kind of men are they choosing? Verse 3. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Why do you need people with good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to serve food? Anybody can serve food, no? Oh, <laughs> equally, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. No, but do you need so much, like full of the Holy Spirit, good reputation? Yeah, yeah. So, see, they wanted good people with good testimony because um, even a volunteer to serve, they chose like this in church. So that really shows us how we must engage volunteers, not randomly, but those who have a good testimony and who are serious about God and they work with God's wisdom. Such people we have to put in charge of tasks. So that's the way they try to solve this problem. And what else do we see? You know, we are seeing the emergence of what we call as church government. Earlier, it was only Peter. Peter will stand up and he'll speak. And that was it. Then slowly we saw Peter and John come into the limelight. And then later, the apostles, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, they laid hands on the apostles. Now what is happening is when the church is growing bigger, there is a need for more people to come in and help for a church structure. So at this point, they are engaging volunteers. Volunteerism has started. But there is a way in which they went about it. They chose people who were godly, not randomly. So they chose godly people. And what did they decide? They decided that they will engage in the ministry of the word, prayer and ministry continually. So that also shows us those of us who are engaged in preaching, teaching, how much time we must dedicate into uh, the study of the word. Right? We can't let go of that and put our energy into other things. We can always, you know, if there is something else which is important but someone else can take care of it, it's okay to delegate delegating to volunteers. So that's uh, what we are seeing emerge here in the church now. So the government, the church structure, where we have a set of volunteers. So when they came up with this decision, look at this, verse 5. 
it pleased the multitude it pleased the multitude okay so the solution was agreeable by the church community they were happy they thought okay fine with this the food distribution problem is going to be solved and they selected seven people so their names are written here uh, we have stephen we have philip we have prochorus nicanor timon parmenas uh, nicholas who were the seven people they were brought before the apostles the apostles prayed and then they appointed them to this work what does it say about stephen yeah full of faith and holy spirit that means he is he is quite a mighty man spiritually okay can we appoint mighty people to do food distribution we can give some other better work no why food distribution okay see god has a call on everyone's life no matter how uh, you know what we are called to and how great our faith and all god has a journey that he puts us through we don't understand why you know a mighty man like stephen full of faith full of holy spirit god is saying stephen you first serve the food <laughs> okay we don't know why because god has a season of preparation in all our lives we may be looking at a great call and saying god i am called to impact the nations god is saying all that's fine today you please serve the food <laughs> okay but that's how god works in our lives we cannot short circuit god's process philip later we'll see when we come to acts 21 philip the evangelist but right now volunteer philip they all have a great call of god on their lives philip uh, stephen became a martyr we'll see in acts chapter 7 uh, however god did not short circuit the journey the preparation time god allowed them to do different things uh, and thank god for these these uh, committed men of god who had a good testimony full of faith filled with the holy spirit and they did a good job so again when it comes to selecting volunteers this is about their spiritual characteristics we must be careful about who where they are at spiritually but also we must check the ability as well what does that mean you know are they capable why were only these seven selected they must have been good spiritually and maybe they were good uh, you know ability wise being able to serve so two things we have to check you know spiritually how are these people and can they do what we are asking them to do you know like for example if we are putting somebody to lead worship can they lead worship are they skilled are they equipped will they be able to are they anointed to do that these are the questions we have to ask just because someone spiritually good what if they are not given the ability to do it they are not grace to like let's say we put somebody to share or preach they are good person very spiritual but not able to preach or share they won't be able to do that work so both are important look for the spiritual um, uh, capability as well as the natural ability grace that god gives for them to do the work anything question ha huh. like how could we know that person is a spiritual or not mm -hmm. okay so see as um, as leadership one thing we can do is observe more than when they are appointed to do something just in their regular uh, you know uh, coming to church and all you we can see so much about a person and their attitude so that helps us recognize that ha huh, this person they they are uh, capable spiritually as well as uh, ability wise okay so observe as a leader we must not uh, do things blindly because it will hurt the whole church community when we when we are careless in appointing you know volunteers leaders uh, so 
observation na chira okay yeah please like uh, so many people uh, we see sometimes like they are very good like in the time to come congregations mm. or like we can see like while leading worship mm. it's like they're, they're very different person but in a personal life they're literally very different i know so like how to manage with this kind of people or like what to do when yeah. we found someone like this yeah yeah so see uh, that's why we are saying no it's better to wait it's better to wait uh, till you find someone who is genuine uh, and who's not playing this you know double uh, double game here and there so even if you don't have a skilled person to lead worship at this point you have somebody who's very um, you know who's learning but their attitude is right better to appoint that person than to appoint somebody who who's so talented but at the same time they they have other things going on you know uh, away from the stage so as a leader it's a tough call it's a tough call tough decision that we make but what to do because spiritual uh, like we saw right good report good report means what everyone says about this person good reputation reputation is what people say about you so not just between god and me but what are people saying about this person it is important yeah ma'am i ask us like uh, so many time i saw like many people mm -hmm. because they are very good to lead worship yeah and uh, in congregation ways they are very good yes so yes, people yes. just see them as their ability like that like what we are learning now it's like totally opposite yeah like uh, good reputation they don't see anything else they just in oh this guy can lead worship okay let appoint them even like uh, in our areas like it's yeah. happening that's why I see attitude is more important than ability both both are necessary you you cannot do the work without ability or without attitude both are important but attitude is more important than ability ability can develop you can train a person with a good attitude their ability can increase but you cannot do it the other way if ability is there and attitude is bad you work with them nothing will change unless they are willing to make the change okay so uh, we have to look into these things because overall uh, the church community uh, will be affected if you put the wrong people for volunteering okay all right so as a result of the uh, apostles solving the problem there was a problem but they solved the simple problem food problem what happened was seven it says the word of god spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith so whenever church leadership we steward the community well it will result in growth it will result in increase imagine in act 6 food issue is there if the apostles did not manage the food issue if they either ignored it or managed it wrongly we will not read verse 7 that the word of god spread the number multiplied so we have to put every effort to solve problems not just spiritual but you know uh, any other connected problems also that's how the church growth will happen okay it's a very practical thing what we have seen today we will study about stephen in the next class any any other questions uh ah. mm -hmm. yeah so people turning to the faith is how we can look at it so external persecution inside the church challenges <laughs> but either way when we are uh, walking with the wisdom of the lord the work is expanding increasing and you know god's word is spreading okay so i'll uh, if there are no questions yeah then we can pray and close 
Uh, can someone from the class here today lead us in prayer? Father God, we thank you for today's class, Lord. Thank you for teaching us, my Father God. Help us to learn and walk in your word, my Father God. Help us to obey. Lord, everything that uh, you have given us, my Father God. And thank you so much for everything, my God. Thank you for my, my Jesus. All glory belongs to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chira. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we will stop for now and continue on Monday. <laughs>